had the joy of being in Newton this morning, and just as I went to get my notes out from Newton, I went into my bag, and then I pulled everything out, and then the heart started beating, and I've left all my notes at Newton. So this morning could be interesting. I'm sure there's lots of really rambling tales you will all enjoy as we share God's Word together. However, as you can see from your sheet, we are starting a new study, and our new study is on the book of Judges. Now, I found out this morning while we were at Newton, Andrew was praying and remembering the fact that it is Pentecost Sunday. And I was like, oh, I hadn't realized it was Pentecost. Wouldn't Pentecost be a brilliant story to do this morning? Shouldn't we be doing Acts? This would be fabulous. And instead, we have the pleasure of a jaunt through Judges. Now, Keith came up with the title of A Jaunt Through Judges, and I was like, yeah, that sounds great. We'll go for A Jaunt Through Judges. And then I started preparing for this morning, and it felt nothing like a jaunt. Judges is a really hard book. And I can often be critical of people who only ever use the New Testament, who say, oh, no, you know, Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. We'd really like concentrating on him. We're going to stick to the New Testament. But actually, God has given us a complete book. He's given us a whole book, and all of it's God's word, and all of it speaks to us today. So it's actually a little bit neglectful if we don't remember to dive into the Old Testament to see what perils we can find in the Old Testament. So we're going to start our jaunt, <laughs> not a jaunt. We're going to start our study um, looking at the book of Judges. But we thought it would be really helpful if we gave you a bit of an overview of the whole thing. We're looking at a couple of particular stories within that book. But we thought rather than just dipping in and dipping out, it would be helpful to just give you that wide picture of what's going on in Judges. So in the seven minutes that Andrew's going to speed to Newton and hopefully get my notes and not get a driving uh, ban or something terrible, um, we have got a video to show you, which will just give you that wide view of the book of Judges, if we could play that now. The book of Judges. So remember, after Joshua led the tribes of Israel into the promised land, he called them to be faithful to their covenant with God by obeying the commands of the Torah. And if they do this, they will show all the other nations what God is like. So Judges begins with the death of Joshua and basically tells the story of Israel's total failure. The book's name comes from the type of leaders Israel had in this period. Before they had any kings, the tribes were all governed by these judges. Now don't think of a courtroom. These were regional political military leaders, more like a tribal chieftain. And you need to be warned, the book of Judges is very disturbing and violent. It tells the tragic tale of Israel's moral corruption, of its bad leadership, and basically how they become no different than the Canaanites. But this sad story is also meant to generate hope for the future. And you can see this in how the book's designed. There's a large introduction that sets the stage for Israel's failure as they don't drive out the remaining Canaanites. Then the large main section of the book has stories about the growing corruption of Israel's judges. And the progression here shows how Israel's leaders go from pretty good to okay to bad to worse. The concluding section is really disturbing and shows the corruption of the people of Israel as a whole. So let's dive in and we can explore each part a bit more. The opening section begins with the tribes of Israel in their territories in the Promised Land. And while Joshua defeated some key Canaanite towns, there was still a lot of land to be taken and lots of Canaanites living in those areas. And so chapter 1 gives a long list of Canaanite groups and towns that Israel just failed to drive out from the land. Now, remember, the whole point of driving out the Canaanites was to avoid their moral corruption and their way of worshipping the gods through child sacrifice. God had called Israel to be a holy people, and that does not happen. Chapter 2 describes how Israel just moved in alongside the Canaanites and adopted all their cultural and religious practices. And it's right here that the story stops. For nearly a whole chapter, the narrator gives us an overview of everything that's about to happen in the body of the book. 
This part of Israel's history, the narrator says, was a series of cycles moving in a downward spiral. So Israel became like the Canaanites, and so they would sin against God. So God would allow them to be conquered and oppressed by the Canaanites, and eventually the Israelites would see the error of their ways and repent. So God would raise up a deliverer, a judge, from among Israel who would defeat the enemy and bring about an era of peace. But eventually Israel would sin again and it would all start over. This cycle provides the literary design and flow for the next main section of the book. It gets repeated for each of the six main judges whose stories are told here. Now the stories of the first three judges, Othniel, Ehud, and Deborah, they are epic adventures. They're also extremely bloody stories. Either the judge themselves or people who help the judge, they defeat their enemies and deliver the people of Israel. The stories about the next three judges are longer and they focus in on the character flaws of the judges which get increasingly worse. So Gideon, he begins pretty well. He's a coward of a man, but he eventually comes to trust that God can save Israel through him. And so he defeats a huge army of Midianites with only 300 men carrying torches and clay pots. But Gideon has a nasty temper and he murders a bunch of fellow Israelites for not helping him in his battle. And then it all goes downhill from there. He makes an idol from the gold that he won in his battles. And then after he dies, all Israel worships the idol as a god and the cycle begins again. The next main judge is Jephthah, who's something of a mafia thug living up in the hills. And when things get really bad for Israel, the elders come to him begging for his help. And Jephthah was a very effective leader. He won lots of battles against the Ammonites, but he was so unfamiliar with the God of Israel, he treats him like a Canaanite God. He vows to sacrifice his daughter if he wins the battle. This tragic story, it shows just how far Israel has fallen. They no longer know the character of their own God, which leads to murder and to false worship. The last judge, Samson, is by far the worst. His life began full of promise, but he has no regard for the God of Israel. He was promiscuous, violent, and arrogant. He did win brutally strategic victories over the Philistines, but only at the expense of his own integrity, and his life ends in a violent rush of mass murder. Now, a quick note. Here, you'll notice a repeated theme in the main section of the book, that at key moments, God's Spirit will empower each of these judges to accomplish these great acts of deliverance. Now, the fact that God uses these really screwed up people doesn't mean he endorses all or even any of their decisions. God is committed first and foremost to saving his people, but all he has to work with is these corrupt leaders. And so work with them, he does. This whole section is designed to show just how bad things have gotten. You can't even tell the Israelites and the Canaanites apart anymore. And that's just the leaders. The final section shows Israel as a whole hitting bottom. There are two tragic stories here, and they are not for the faint of heart. They're structured by this key line that gets repeated four times at the close of the book. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. The first story is about an Israelite named Micah, who builds a private temple to an idol, and that gets plundered by a private army sent from the tribe of Dan. So they come and they steal everything, and then they go and burn down the peaceful city of Laish and murder all of its inhabitants. It's a horrifying story. When Israel forgets its God, might makes right. The final story of the book is even worse. It's a shocking tale of sexual abuse and violence, which all leads to Israel's first civil war. It's very disturbing. And that's the point. These stories are meant to serve as a warning. Israel's descent into self-destruction is the result of turning away from the God who loves them and saved them out of slavery in Egypt. And now Israel needs to be delivered again from themselves. The only glimmer of hope in this story is found in this repeated line in the last part of the book. It actually forms the last sentence of the story. Israel 
has no king. And so the stage is set for the following books to tell the origins of King David's family, the book of Ruth, and also the origins of kingship itself in Israel, the book of 1 Samuel. But the story of Judges has value as a tragedy. It's a sobering explanation of the human condition, and ultimately it points out the need for God's grace to send a king who will rescue his people. And that's the book of Judges. So, are you even more excited about the book of Judges now? Violence, abuse, disasters. Oh, ready for a jaunt? Well, I am. Um... And you know, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I wonder who here um, uses Facebook. The church here even has its own Facebook page. But when we use Facebook, what we tend to do is edit our lives a little bit. I don't put photos of my dirty sink with a pot that's been lying for three days. I like to keep that personal just to myself and my family. We put pictures of lovely meals that we've had, we, things that we've been out celebrating, birthdays. We edit our lives. When we put ourselves out on Facebook, we do it in such a way that shows the best side of us. I was at a girl's lunch recently and there was about six of us and my sister says, I'll take a photo and put it on Facebook. Well, 20 minutes later, after some heavy editorial, oh, I don't like that, my eyes are closed on that one. Oh no, you've got the wrong side. Can you just go a bit further back? We want to present our best selves to the world and rightly so. But as we see from judges, this is not like that. Judges needed some heavy editing. They had everything out there, all the mistakes, all the failures, all being documented. When I moved house to our new place, I had a box with all my old memories, all the kind of special sentimental bits and pieces from over the years. And as I was going through my box, I found my old journals. You would have thought I was the most miserable person in the entire world. These journals were not cheerful reading. <gasps> Life's a disaster. I don't know what I'm doing. It was proper teenage angst and despair at its very best. But it made radio head sound cheery. I mean, this was seriously gloomy stuff. And I wonder, I said, why did I not write anything cheerful? Why did I not write about it? Because I know I had some good times. But for some reason, I was caught in the moment in the good times, and my journal was preserved just for my very darkest moments. When I went on to become a youth worker, I was working alongside a group of teenage girls, and I would hear them chatting, and I would remember those moments of angst, those times of real lowness, Moments where I thought, I just don't know what I'm doing. And I wasn't quite brave enough to get my journal out and read the excerpts. But I was able to identify with them. I was able to say, Do you know, I really know what you're going through. I remember how dark life felt in those times. I wrote down in my journal some of the tough stuff. And I love that in this holy book, we have got some of the tough stuff. So, let's join together and read for our passage, which is Judges 4, reading from one there from verse 1 to 23. Now I have to confess, when I read this at Newton, I skipped some of the words, because they're just really big words that are quite impronounceable, and I'm really nervous, it's now going to be on the screen. <laughs> so I can't hide, I can't read really over them, and so uh, work with me. Um, and also, I find one of the things I actually struggle with in the Old Testament is because the words are quite difficult, because the names they use are quite difficult, it can sometimes feel a little bit harder to follow. So I really pray you're able to keep up with the story and follow along with us. I will be on the screen and um, don't laugh at the pronunciation, um, but I'll give it a go. So, Deborah. After he had died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into 
convened in Hazar. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Hanashev, Hagelion. Because he had 900 iron chariots and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel, in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, son of Abelon, from Kedesh in Naphtalah, and said to her, the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you ten thousand men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops, to the Kishon River, and give you, and give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I'll go. But if you don't go with me, I won't go. Very well, David said, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honour will not be yours, for the Lord will hand Cessna over to a woman. So David went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. Ten thousand followed him, and David also went with him. Now, there the Kenite was left, had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hoag, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree near Kadesh. And when they told Sisera that Barak, son of Adelman, had gone up to the tower, Sisera gathered together his 900 iron chariots and all the men with him, from Hamashev, Hagelin, to the Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? So Barak went down Mount Tower, followed by ten thousand men. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all the chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera abandoned his chariots and fled on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Hamashesh, Hagelin. All the troops of Sisera fell by the sword. Not a man was left. Sisera, however, fled on feet to the tent of Jia, the wife of Heather the Kenite, because they were friendly relations between Jabin, king of Hazar, and the clan of Heather the Kenite. Jia went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Come, my lord, come in. Don't be afraid. So he entered her tent, and she put a covering over him. I'm thirsty, he said. Please give me some water. She opened a skin of milk, gave him a drink, and covered him up. Stand in the doorway of the tent, he told her. If someone comes by and asks you, is there anyone here, say no. But Jael, Heber's wife, picked up a tent peg and a hammer and went quietly to him while he lay fast asleep. Exhausted, she drove the peg through his temple into the ground and he died. Barak came by in pursuit of Sisera and Jael went out to him. Come, she said, I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went in with her and there lay Sisera with the tent peg through his temple, dead. On that day, God subdued Jabin, the Canaanite king, before the Israelites. And the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger and against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. Whew, not easy reading, is it? My goodness. There's lots of things in this passage that we can consider. But you know, it wouldn't be right to not acknowledge that in the book of Judges, there are a whole range of men. 
and there's one woman dead on. Now there's different interpretations as to the significance of Dega. For some, they interpret this book by saying, oh, the Israelites were in such a diabolical state. They were doing such a terrible job that the only person they could get to meet them was a woman. Women in this culture, in this period of time, were absolutely not treated as equal. And to be in leadership showed the desperation of how awful a job the men were doing. There's nobody that can do this job. We're going to have to go to the absolute and last resort. A woman. They interpret this as being the desperate, the desperate place that the Israelites are in. However, for our this there are a different interpretation. They say, actually, isn't this brilliant? All these men, and there is a woman in leadership. There is a woman leading the country. The country. For them, this is a really inspiring passage where women are open to being involved in leadership. And for me, my own story of being called into ministry has involved a whole range of views and a whole range of opinions. For me, growing up in the church that I was part of was a very traditional conservative church. Leadership was absolutely set apart for the men. But you know, my minister was so encouraging with me. I would have all these crazy hairbrain ideas. Oh, can we do this? Can I read the do that? Can I do this? Oh, I'd love to share with the congregation about this. And he was always completely open to whatever I suggested. Even though it was this very conservative environment. I never once really noticed the fact that I was a girl. And I certainly never felt that my gender stopped me moving forward in my faith and in my passion and in my calling. As I've already mentioned, I was a youth worker, and interestingly, I was a youth worker in a brethren church. Now, the brethren tradition have very firm ideas about women in leadership. And I read it about to you think, it's okay, I'm the distance that they do know that I'm a girl, like, is everybody okay with this? And they were completely open to it, and I was invited to lead their young people. I was invited to train the young women into roles of leadership from this very, very traditional background. Just incredible. And then just recently, when I was doing my training, I was offered to do a summer placement, and I wanted to go to Seattle. We have friends in Seattle, and kids taking advantage over the summer of doing these exchanges, which are just such brilliant opportunities. So I got in touch with the people in Seattle and oh no, my name was officially disappeared. Ah, do you want to make it in a box? <laughs> <laughs> See, they are under that in a box. Let me just check. No, I want to stop my phone. No, it's not. That's fine. Oh well, I've done something in the middle of the day. Ah, it's here. Anyway, so Seattle. I got in touch with this guy in Seattle. It's a really good church. Really. was a church that was just seeking God. They were faithful Christians with a particular interpretation on the Bible. And I didn't feel in the slightest bit angry. I didn't feel in the slightest bit like my hackles were up. How very dare they? I'm going to go to war theologically and tell you what's what. Didn't worry me. They're serving and they're loving God. And that's absolutely fine. And I honor and support that. There are all different ways to interpret the Bible. There's all different ways in looking into leadership. 
But you know, as I read this story of Deborah, I wonder about you. I had some questions I would love to ask Deborah. How did she feel as the only woman in this list of men? Did she feel the weight of responsibility? Did she feel like, oh, I better get this right, because if I don't, you know what they're all going to say? And I don't know who's looking forward to the football later today. We are very excited in the Purden House as Scotland finally makes it to the World Cup. But it's the women's team that have done it. How brilliant is that? We are so excited. There was a program on during the week that told you the story of these women reaching the World Cup, told you the story of some of the opposition they've had. For some of these girls growing up to say you wanted to play football, Pah, can't play football, that's for the boys. All the things that have been said against them, calling them tomboys, and now here they are representing their country. I think the manager's brilliant, I really like her. And I have the same questions for Deborah as I would maybe ask her. Do you feel the pressure? How does it feel? And then you will have noticed, um, as he describes uh, Deborah in the passage, it was Deborah, wife of Lapidoth. Wonder if he got a hard time. Wonder if they said, oh, check you out. Your wife's a bit of a bossy bitch, is she not? I wonder how that dynamic was. We don't know if Deborah had children. I wonder if she felt guilty not putting the kids to bed because she had to come up with the war battle for the army. Did she struggle? Did she feel the weight of expectations? I wonder. And we'll never know. Who knows? I don't know if I'll get a chat with Deborah when we get to heaven. But I've got my questions all ready for her. But I wonder for some of us gathered here today, do we feel the pressure of expectation? Do we feel that sense of needing to prove ourselves? Do we feel the pressure of being a better parent? Do we feel the pressure of being a better neighbour, of being the only person in your family to go to uni, so I really have to make something of myself? Do we come to church and then rather than feel the blessing of God, do we feel pressurised to be a good Christian? This morning, shake off all those feelings of expectation all those feelings of having to prove yourself. God has a calling, not so that you prove yourself, but for him to be glorified. Back to our passage. So, we've continued in our story. Deborah's told Barak what the plan is. Here's the strategy. You're going to do this. You're going to sort this out. Deborah's got it sorted. And what does Barak say? Oh, I'm only coming if you come to you. <laughs> Isn't that brilliant? And you know, there's two ways to interpret that as well. For some, they interpret that as saying, oh, this really does go to show how desperate these Israelite men were. They are so utterly useless, not only as a woman in power, but they refuse to go anywhere without her being there. For some, Barak is an absolute sissy of the highest order. <laughs> sissy Barak. <laughs> Sounds like... I don't know, a pop star. Um, but for others, they interpret that very differently. And they say, oh, Barak is actually extremely sensible. He knows fine well God's anointing is on Deborah. And he's saying, if Deborah's not there, there's no way I'm going to battle without God's anointed person beside me. Ha, don't think so. Barak is actually acting very wisely by keeping Deborah on side. And again, we don't really know what the interpretation is, but we do know that to battle they went. <coughs> and those men, I, I imagine them all with their knees knocking and their swords, thinking, oh my goodness, we're off to battle, as seeing the enemy 900 chariots before them. And yet, they knew that God was with them. They had the confidence that Deborah was anointed and they went to battle and they won. Not one 
living person survived the battle, apart from Sisera. Sisera did a runner and found shelter in the tent of Jael. Now, do not underestimate how shocking this would have been to the come into my tent, find protection and safety here. This was a real act of hospitality and it would also be like um, in the past when you went to a monastery and you could find safety with the nuns and know that you would be completely safe there because nobody would break in. Sisera felt completely relaxed, thank goodness. There's been an alliance made between the tribes, the kings, our pals. It's all going to be okay. I'm going to be safe. But isn't it interesting? He asks for water and she gives him milk. So she's luring him to sleep. She's already got her plans on what's going to happen. And sure enough, Sisera, after a long battle, falls asleep. And then a brutal act of murder takes place. Do you know, I shouldn't tell you this, but the version that they use at Newton was so, I don't know what version they use actually, Andrew, what do they use there? New Re- the New English. The New English. <sighs> they didn't hold back. They were talking about brains oozing out. It was totally disgusting. I know. Um, I did skip over it, but I thought I'd tell you all. <laughs> Sorry. But this was really disgusting. This was so awful what she did. And she did this hideous act of murder, breaking every hospitality code that could be imagined. This, she really lured him in, lied, and then killed him. Now, if it was shocking to think about a woman being in leadership, to die at the hands of a woman was just the most enormous humiliation that could be imagined. The shame of being killed by a woman. But not only that, women in those days, one of their responsibilities was to put up the tents and take down the tents. So to be killed in such a way would be like today being killed with an iron and an ironing board. This would be like women's jobs doing the job. I mean, there's been time, I don't actually have an iron or an ironing board in our house, so Richard is completely safe if I ever take the notion. <laughs> but it is just the most gigantic shame imaginable. Killed by a woman with a tent peg. You could imagine the first readers reading this. This is the most unbelievable twist in the tale. My goodness, how could this be? I don't know about you, but I love a twist ending where you follow a film and all of a sudden you're like, they are not dead or they're alive. It is totally shocking. It would be like that for these first readers, reading this passage. Oh my goodness, what an end to the enemy, (laughs) to be slayed by a woman. And you know, God uses all of us. He uses all of us with all our flaws. Jael was by no means a good example, but she accomplished the work of God. We are reading about her today because she was obedient to God. I'd like to share with you a story, and it's a story that I came across when I was at university. One of our courses that we did was called Religion, Violence, and Peace Building. And it was such a good course. I absolutely loved it. And one of our focuses looked particularly at women and peace building. And it's always surprised me that women aren't more involved with peace talks and with peace building. Because as a mum with two children, I deal with conflict on a daily basis. Well, you just play nicely together. You've had it long enough. Now it's your turn. Honestly, when I see conflicts, I think, send in the mammies, the mammies, I'll sort them out. However, sadly, so many of these peace talks involve men. However, there's one woman who is involved in a peace movement, and her name is Lema Gabawi. I think there's a photo of her. Now, she's from Liberia, 
and she was born in the first civil war in Liberia and ex experienced unbelievable trauma and unbelievable, horrendous experiences as a child. As she grew up, life didn't get any easier. She was around a lot of conflict. Her first baby was born in a hospital and she stayed in the corridor of that hospital for a week, her and her newborn baby, because she couldn't pay the fees and the bills for the hospital and she had nobody to help her. For this woman, life was very, very difficult. And she chose to use some of those experiences to help other people. So she was involved with a lot of work, working with women who have experienced trauma and abuse, and worked with a project in Liberia. One evening, she was working late and was sleeping in her office, and she had a dream. And in the dream, God spoke to her, and he said, get up, gather the women, and pray. She spoke to some friends the next day and says, oh, I had this really vivid dream last night. I dreamt God called me to call the women to gather to pray. And the women said, well, we think this is God and we'll stand with you. So a group started and they gathered women and they prayed. They prayed in the fish markets, they prayed in the street, they sang songs in the streets, uh, Gabawi, crossed every ethnic barrier, she crossed over ethnic lines, over religious lines, and she gathered women with one charge, and that was for change, and that was for peace. So the Civil War had kicked off, this was 2003, the Civil War had kicked off, they continually protested, they gathered women, they all wore white, so they would just, they stripped away any um, sense of class, any sense of background, and women of all generations gathered and protested in white. And they handed out leaflets, and the leaflet said, we are tired. We are tired of our children being killed. We are tired of abuse. We want change, and we want peace. For many of the women, they didn't read, so they had pictures drawn in the leaflets of gathering and uniting these women. There was peace talks in a very fancy hotel, and the women marched to the hotel and barricaded the men in. <laughs> I mean, how brilliant is that? They just says, right, that's it. So they gathered, they made their protest, but then the, the, the talks were going on for so long. They started in the June. By end of July, the women were like, we have absolutely had enough of this. So they stormed the hotel, they went right to the door, they linked arms, and they said, we're taking you hostage. Nobody moves until you come out with an agreement. And at first the men were like, ha, 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 this is ridiculous, General Gabawi and her troops, ha, 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 it's a bunch of women. But then actually they realised this is serious. When they tried to move, the woman says, we will take our clothes off. And in Africa, to do that, to, for an elderly woman or a married woman, that would, be, that would bring a curse onto you. So the talks started to turn very seriously. And these women refused to move. And in a couple of days, they had their agreement. Now, Leymar Gavawi is by no means the perfect example of a woman. She had a number of failed relationships. Her family life was very chaotic. She really wrestled with alcohol at various stages of her life. But she changed the course of a country's history because she was faithful to God. She was faithful to his invite to gather the women in praying. It wasn't Gabawi that changed. It was a prayer, wasn't it? That's what did it. The women gathered and prayed, and war came to an end. I wonder for us if there's areas where we need to be faithful and to rise up. As I think of that tent peg getting driven into the enemy, are there areas where we need to drive in a tent peg? But I wonder if this is a more useful symbol for us.
symbol of violence, a symbol of torture, redeemed to be a symbol of hope and a symbol of love. Where do we need to drive the cross? Who's our enemy? Sickness, injustice, poverty, oppression? Where do we need to drive the cross in and see God's love and God's freedom? We are flawed people. We are gathered, but we are faithful. And God can use us. He doesn't ask us to be perfect. He does ask us to be faithful. Regardless of our gender, regardless of our age, regardless of our class, regardless of our theology, God calls each one to live a life of action, to oust the enemy and to see God's kingdom come. Let's pray. Father, we see in your word so many inspiring stories of heroes, not always the best of characters, but seeking your will. And God, we see in society around us inspirational men and women standing up to be counted. Father, as we celebrated D-Day, this week and heard story after story of the sacrifice of others. Father, we pray for each one of us here that we might be people who rise up, who answer the call and who follow you. Holy Spirit, would you speak to each one of us? Show us where we need to drive your cross of hope. In Jesus' name. Amen.